Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the uh, Top 500 BOF uh, here at SC. This is a little bit unusual year, so we're having uh, little technical problems, but I think we've uh, sorted through most of them, and hopefully we can uh, have this uh, show go on. So today in the Top 500 BOF, we're going to have uh, five presentations. Um, uh, we're going to have the presentations of the Top 500 Awards plus the Green 500. Uh, Wu Fang, who's here with me, is going to... Um, uh, present the Green 500, and I will hand out the awards for the Top 500, HPCG, and HP, uh, L, HP, HPLAI. And um, uh, so the agenda looks uh, something like this. Um, the awards will be given out. Uh, Horst is going to present uh, a challenge that he laid down a number of years ago uh, with, some, uh, with a colleague in Germany, and we'll, we'll hear the story about we're still waiting for Exascale. David Kahaner, uh, who uh, works at uh, ATIP, uh, gathering information uh, on uh, Asian activities, will talk about some of the things going on uh, in China. And then Eric will, uh, will conclude with the uh, highlights of the top 500 list this time in, in the traditional talk that's given about the... Uh, about the statistics for the top 500. And then we'll have uh, Q&As. The Q&As should come in on Slido. We'll monitor those Slido um, uh, uh, questions and, and hopefully can provide some answers. I have to mention that this is being recorded. Uh, so the video is being recorded and it'll be uh, seen later. So first, um, let me just mention a few things about the top 500 list. Uh, this uh, this uh, activity started back in June of 1993 uh, with uh, Hans Moyer and Eric Strohmeyer and myself putting together a list of the 500 fastest machines. The origins really is that uh, Eric and Hans had a list of the 500 um, uh, machines listed by theoretical peak performance. I had some benchmark numbers in terms of the LINPAC benchmark, and we merged those two lists together. So this is the 29th year of that, uh, of that list. Uh, 58 editions have come out. It's done twice a year. It's done at the ISC meeting, which is held in Germany, and uh, this conference, uh, which is held in, uh, in the States in November. And uh, it really tracks the evolution of high-performance computing over time, providing a sense of what's happened and perhaps giving us a glimpse into the future by, into the future by doing some projections. The top 500 is based on uh, the LINPAC benchmark, and the LINPAC benchmark is to solve a system of linear equations, uh, AX equals B, uh, where we uh, have a dense matrix problem uh, to solve. The ground rules for solving that is, uh, is that, uh, are that you need to use um, a, a very specific algorithm. Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting has to be used. You have to uh, solve that system of equations to 64-bit uh, accuracy. Uh, that is, you have to use 64-bit computations in the process and solve it to a prescribed, uh, prescribed accuracy. Um, we're also going to be reporting on a number of other benchmarks, the top 500, which I mentioned, uh, the HPCG benchmark, which measures a slightly different thing, solves a system of linear equations, but uses a different technique. The matrix itself is not dense, but sparse, and uh, it's intended to more model what really happens on many uh, high-performance machines, that is, uh, looking at the solution of, of uh, three-dimensional partial differential equations, uh, through a discretization process, which leads to a sparse matrix problem, which is solved using an iterative method. So that's the HPCG benchmark and looking then at the performance for that. We'll also talk about the uh, HPL AI benchmark, which is um, a benchmark which uh, tries to uh, stress uh, using short precision, perhaps 16-bit arithmetic, in solving the problem and then using some mathematical techniques to enhance the accuracy of that 16-bit uh, approximation up to 64-bit. And then we're going to look at the performance of that. And finally, um, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll present uh, the Green 500. Uh, Wu Fang uh, has, uh, has championed this over years and it ranks uh, the, um, the most uh, energy efficient uh, high performance machines using the top 500 as the basis uh, for that uh, measurement. And here we're concerned with uh, performance per watt is the metric that's going to be used. Okay, so moving on with the show, 
Uh, let me uh, go through. This is the list of uh, awards we'll be giving out. We'll do this first. And uh, the first uh, one goes to the number one position on the top 500. And that, uh, that award will go to um, the uh, Fugaku uh, system. So the Fugaku system is a, is a machine uh, uh, running at uh, Riken uh, in Kobe. It's a machine based on uh, architecture that Fujitsu uh, and the people at Riken have uh, designed. It's based on an ARM processor. It, um, it's, uh, it's number one today. It's been on the top 500 list uh, since 2020. Uh, so four times it's, uh, it's achieved this number one position. It has about 7.6 million cores and achieved uh, 442 petaflops. So I wonder if I could ask uh, Satoshi Matsuoka to join me on stage uh, to collect uh, the top 500 award. And um, uh, I'll progress the slide. Next slide, please. Not only did they win uh, the number one position on the top 500, they've also achieved the number one position on the HPCG benchmark, uh, the benchmark that looks at um, uh, doing and uh, using the sparse matrix computation. And they also have achieved uh, the number one position on the uh, HPL AI benchmark, uh, achieving um, a, a stunning performance of uh, two exaflops. Two exaflops, very impressive uh, results. So we have certificates for the number one position. So this is uh, for the number one position on the top 500. This is for the number one position on the uh, HPCG benchmark. Sorry. And this is a certificate for uh, the number one position on the HP. <laughs> <laughs> HPL AI benchmark. <laughs> Congratulations to Satoshi and his uh, colleagues at Riken and Fujitsu for putting together such a very impressive uh, high performance uh, system. Thank you very much, Jack. We're very honored. Uh, next up is next slide. There we go. The number the number two uh, 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 machine on the top 500 is a machine. Um, uh, that's at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's the Summit uh, supercomputer. It's um, been on the list uh, uh, since uh, 2018. It has um, uh, 2.4 million uh, cores in it. It has a performance of 148 uh, petaflops. It's using an IBM technology along with uh, NVIDIA GPUs. So uh, Ashley, can you come up and uh, collect the uh, HP um, uh, the HPL benchmark uh, number two position. In addition to, um, in addition to the uh, HPL benchmark, uh, they also received number two position on the HPCG uh, benchmark, uh, uh, achieving a performance of 2.8 petaflops, and uh, uh, they've also achieved a number two position on the uh, HPL AI uh, benchmark, uh, achieving a performance of 1.4 exaflops. Very impressive results indeed. So here's the uh, top 500 award. <laughs> here's the uh, HPCG award. And here's the uh, HPL AI award. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Next slide. And um, uh, the, the, the number three machine uh, on, the, um, uh, on the top 500 list uh, will go to uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, that's for the um, Sierra uh, uh, supercomputer. The Sierra supercomputer is also based on IBM and NVIDIA technology. Uh, it achieved uh, a performance of uh, 94.6 uh, petaflops uh, for its uh, performance on the list. Uh, it's very similar to the Summit architecture. It was also installed in uh, 2018. Uh, it uses the IBM Power9 processors. It has a slightly different configuration in terms of the NVIDIA processors uh, using uh, four of those NVIDIA processors. So here to collect this award is Chris.
Thank you very much. Uh, next, in terms of the uh, awards, is, um, is the number one uh, machine in Europe. So this is a system uh, in Europe uh, uh, that uh, achieved uh, the number one position. It's a machine in, in Ulich at, um, at the High Performance Computing Center. It's a machine that's based on, um, uh, based on uh, uh, from, from a bull system. Uh, it, it achieved 44 petaflops. Uh, it, it's based on an AMD parts plus uh, NVIDIA GPUs, A100 uh, GPUs, and the Mellanox interconnect. It was introduced in 2020, and uh, they are ranked number one in Europe. So let me uh, hand out this award. Is there somebody from the ULIC Center who can collect the award? We have this problem this year. It'll be virtually collected, and we will um, ship that on to them. Uh, for the future. Um, the next award goes to, um, uh, goes to Lawrence Berkeley Lab for the Perlmutter machine. Uh, it achieved uh, the number three uh, position in terms of the HPCG benchmark, and uh, it achieved 1.8 uh, petaflops on that, on that system. Uh, the uh, Perlmutter uh, is a relatively new machine uh, was just upgraded, in fact, uh, in this year uh, to achieve a performance of 1.9 petaflops. It's based on an HPE technology Cray with uh, AMD and NVIDIA A100 processors. So is there someone from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to collect the award? Of course, Simon, you'll have to collect this award and virtually be sent uh, to you. Next uh, award to be given out is the H for the HPL AI benchmark that goes to Celine. Celine is a machine uh, that's at the um, uh, NVIDIA site. Uh, so it's a machine that's uh, based on AMD and uh, NVIDIA A100 processors with a Mellanox interconnect. It was introduced in 2020 and um, it's, uh, it's in-house uh, within uh, NVIDIA itself being used for AI, uh, AI systems work. Um, and it achieved uh, 63, uh, six, 0 0.63 petaflops on the HPL, uh, sorry, 0.63 exaflops on the HPL AI benchmark. So is there someone from NVIDIA who can collect uh, this award? Not today. Okay, let me uh, turn this over to Wu Fang, who's going to hand out the next three awards. Press that button to answer it. Okay, thank you, Jack. Um, so the number one uh, machine on the Green 500 is uh, from uh, Preferred Networks and Kobe University. It is the uh, MN3 uh, Preferred Networks MN Core server system uh, in uh, Japan. And uh, it achieved 39.4 gigaflops per watt uh, on the Linpack uh, benchmark. And if you look at those numbers and, and uh, do a, an optimistic linear extrapolation of 39.4 uh, gigaflops per watt to exaflop, we're looking at a, a supercomputer, exascale supercomputer on the order of about 25 to 26 megawatts uh, in terms of its uh, power envelope. Uh, this is a, a, a deep learning accelerated uh, supercomputer, uh, again, from, from Japan. Do we have um, folks from, uh, from Preferred Networks and Kobe University who could come up and accept it? There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Do we, I can't tell, do we advance this? There we go, okay. All right, uh, and number two is uh, a supercomputer from uh, the University of Cambridge. It's Wilkes 3, a Dell PowerEdge system. 
this is a, a system that uh, has done very well in the green 500. Uh, it was at number three. Uh, the last list and has, has moved up a spot um, in terms of energy efficiency. It comes up at 30.8 gigaflops per watt uh, in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, do we have a representative from the University of Cambridge here? Virtually accepted. It'll be virtually accepted here. So, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the, third, uh, the third supercomputer is uh, from the University of Florida. It's called Hypergator, uh, or Hypergator AI, I should say. It's an NVIDIA DGX A100 uh, superpod system, uh, and it comes in just under 30 gigaflops per watt at 29.5 gigaflops per watt. Um, do we have a, a representative from the University of Florida here? If not, we're going to virtually accept that as well. And I'd like to note uh, here is that uh, so the, these three green, one, green 500 presentations were made, uh, in particular for the, the number one supercomputer uh, on the green 500, the MN3. Uh, I'd encourage folks to uh, come to the green 500 BOF, which is tomorrow uh, at 5.15 to 6.45, and you'll find out uh, quite a bit more information about the, the uh, the, the MN3 uh, supercomputer. So let me um, turn it back over. I'll turn it over to, I believe, Horst. Horst Simon is going to be next. If we can key up Horst slides. Take it away, Thank Horst. you, Jack. Am I on? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so we have seen in the top uh, positions of the top 500 and the other lists, that we have several hundreds of petaflops for the HPL benchmark. And we have some extra level performance for the lower precision HPL AI benchmark, but we're still waiting for the extra flop performance on the high performance LIN pack in 64 bit. Next slide, please. So what I mean by we're waiting is, is that if we look back in history, uh, the first teaflop machine was probably the Cray 2, that was pre-top 500 in 85. In 1997, the ASCII RED was the first teraflop machine. In 2008, the Roadrunner at Los Alamos was the first petaflop machine. And so if you look at this, you might say that there's a about uh, 11 or 12 years of distance. So by 2019, we should have had the exaflop impact benchmark, but now 21 is almost over and we still are waiting for the exaflop uh, impact benchmark. Next slide, slide please. So the interesting thing was that there was indication in the 2010 timeframe that things are going to slow down. And I had a personal bet with Thomas Lippert uh, that we will not reach the XR flop by November 2019. At that time, we bet for $2,000, that was my end, or 2,000 euro, euro on Thomas's end. And uh, in November 21, there's still no one XR flop, Limpac 64 bit, our max system on the list. So what happened to the bet? Thomas, of course, as a gentleman, offered money to me, but next slide. We decided that uh, Thomas raised the amount to 3,000 euro, uh, and we want to offer this amount of surprise for the first demonstration of one exaflop Limpac HPL 64-bit performance. And we would like this result to be described in a paper or technical report. The authors of the paper will receive the prize, and we encourage, of course, the inclusion of early career scientists in the project. And Jack has agreed to certify the result as a valid HPL Limpac submission, which means once it's submitted for a, as an HPL Limpac benchmark, then it will be presumably the next number one on the top 500 list and will be the first system to break the exaflop 64 bit RMAX uh, Limpac. Uh, number on the top 500 list. So we're still waiting and I hope that 3000 euro is enough of an encouragement to get somebody going and submit the paper. And you know, 
uh, we know that there are machines out there. And so I think with that, I probably want to turn it over to David Kahana, who will talk about some potential candidates machines that are existing in China already that could be set to break this barrier. So for everybody else, happy computing. And I hope we will have at the 59th list in Hamburg in May, the Exaflop system. Happy computing on top of it. Okay, David, your, your slides start. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks to the organizers, especially Horst and Jack, for encouraging me to come and give a few comments about the situation in China. Full disclosure, I haven't been to China this year because of COVID, but we have a couple of people working there with us. So I think the information that I have is accurate. Next slide, please. So actually, uh, I claim there are two exaflop systems today running in China, and a third, which is uh, a maybe, it's delayed. I don't know if you can read this, so I'll just run through it very quickly. The first one is in the city of Qingdao, which is on the coast at a relatively new mission-oriented um, laboratory focused on marine science and everything related to that. That machine is uh, called Ocean Light, or the translation is called Ocean Light. It was completed in March of this year, and uh, it runs at about 1.3 exaflops peak, and the LIMPAC number is 1.05 exaflops, we are told. Uh, it's not official, but that's what we've been told by several people. In addition to that, they've also run some 16-bit calculations. And this was reported just very recently in a paper that appeared um, in the China, HPC China 2001, just uh, two or three weeks ago. That the, they measured 4.4 exaflops um, for the 16 bit, it's actually mixed precision, but 16 bit. The technology is basically um, Shen Wei. I'm sure you're gonna hear more about that in some of the other talks, so I'll skip that. Um, this particular machine is probably not gonna get a lot of access from outside China because the lab that it's in is focused in, in a very specific mission oriented way. The second exaflop system is uh, in the city of Tianjin Tianjin is uh, um, east of Beijing, and you may remember it if you go back to 2010, when it was the place that Tianhe 1A showed up at. That was the first machine from China that was the top of the top 500. Uh, but now the new machine is called Tianhe 3. It's based on um, some uh, arm and uh, um, accelerator technology. The system is completed, we are told, the end of last month, although there's also an opportunity for in, in, uh, enhancing it in various ways. We estimate 1.7 exaflops peak and uh, just over 1.3 exaflops uh, on 64-bit LIMPAC. And we were just told actually day before yesterday that uh, the first LINPAC run tentative gave them the, the numbers that I was just mentioning, one point, over 1.3. This particular facility might be more open to people outside China, I hope it is. The third system is more complicated because it involves a company, uh, a company Suyan that once was supposed to de develop and implement a uh, two exaflop system that was supposed to be installed next year, but it's been delayed for a variety of complicated region, reasons I don't have time to talk about here. Um, the processor is a uh, high gun, which was supposed to be theirs, but uh, I don't think they're gonna be able to produce uh, enough at the, the, right, the right spec. So maybe they can get AMD or something if, if that's allowed with, uh, with uh, the sanctions. The key point of this slide though, is to say that there are actually two exaflop systems in China, period, full stop. Next slide, please. 
So just so that you can get some context, there's a map here showing where the national supercomputer centers are. The, there are eight of them that are running and there are two that are being built. The two that are being built are in Dalian. You can see Dalian on the little uh, peninsula there on the, on the east and in Xi'an. In Xi'an, you probably might be hard to, to read. It's just uh, above number seven in Zhengzhou over there. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to those um, exaflop systems, there are a significant number of large multi-hundred petaflop systems that are either coming online or will come online very, very soon. For example, uh, in the city of Jinan, there's a National Supercomputer Center. And you may remember Jinan because that was the site where the Shenwei blue light machine first surfaced. That was the first petaflop system from China using Chinese processors. Uh, but the new system uh, is, we're told, going to use uh, GPUs and some Xeon base nodes with about 250 peak petaflops. In addition, Sugan, uh, the Chinese company, is producing and uh, deploying systems in at least three facilities in China, again, using Hygon processors or maybe uh, AMD, I, I don't know. One is in the city of Chengdu, which, uh, which they've got about 60% of the 300 petaflops that uh, already um, deployed. Another national supercomputer center in Zhengzhou, They've got um, 300 petaflops planned, about 100 petaflops uh, running. And then the third one in the city of uh, Kunshan, which we don't know how many have been deployed, but there are about 300 petaflops total planned. The thing, the key point of this slide is that China now has, or will very shortly have, a significant amount of compute capability, it's not really going to be a poor country in terms of computing. So they should be able to do some good work. Next slide, please. In addition to that, there's actually talk about going forward. So about a year ago, Professor Depe Chen, who many of you know, a very esteemed computer scientist uh, from Beihang University, suggested, I wouldn't say proposed, but suggested, um, development of two 10 exaflop systems by 2025. Uh, whether that is taken seriously or not, I don't know, but uh, this past summer at ISC, that idea of 10 exaflop systems uh, were, uh, were brought, brought forward by a representative from the Wuxi Supercomputer Center. And uh, if such a system were to be developed, Wuxi would be a good place to do it because they have lots of technology and a lot of experience. Next, next slide, please. So th this is a slide that came uh, from the China HPC, HPC China 2021 that I told you just ended a few weeks ago. And it illustrates it's all from the Sunway ocean light uh, community. There are uh, three science specific applications that are mentioned. One of them is uh, Raman scattering. Uh, another one is for uh, some quantum type simulation. And a third is related to plasma simulation, a tokamak. And in, on the engineering side, uh, molecular dynamics, uh, nanomaterials, and um, face re-entry. And you'll notice that the top three, the ones in the science tra track, uh, I'm told, uh, I think Jack could verify this, but I'm told that all three have been nominated for Gordon Bell Awards. So that's pretty impressive. Um, next slide. Um, so this is very interesting. You'll notice that when Jack gave out the awards for the top 500, there were no Chinese systems there. What the heck happened? Okay, well, China has its own version of the uh, top 500. They call it the top 100. And that was the most recent one was released um, just last Friday. We translated a piece of this and you can look at it here. This is the most bizarre list I've ever heard of. For example, the number one machine on this list is almost certainly a cloud 
cloud system generates 125 petaflops. Uh, the number two is the Sung, Sungwei Taihu light, which uh, we know about. The number three is some unspecified network uh, provider. We don't know anything about that. The number four is uh, Tenhei 2A, even though I said there's a Tenhei 3. And the number five is again, some uh, unspecified uh, organization. So the two big machines that I mentioned earlier are just not there. So uh, we decided what we would do is we produce our own version of this to see what we think it would look like. So next slide, please. This is what I call ATIP's more realistic China top 100. Uh, number one, would be uh, Tanhei 3, as I mentioned, 1.3 exaflops. Number two is uh, this ocean light, uh, just over one exaflop. Number three is an unspecified networking company. Number four is a pr product from Sugan using uh, their cooling, special immersive cooling technology uh, and the, they call silicon cube. And then number four, is Sunway Taihu Light. Now you might ask why in the world aren't those big machines on either the, the Chinese list or the US list? Now you can speculate on that. I'm gonna let you think about that. Next, next slide, please. Okay, I just wanna leave by saying something about it, uh, applications. China is just absolutely swamped with AI applications. They occur across the technology landscape. You can see on the left side there, all the different sectors, uh, but they all fit somehow, somehow under the rubric of smart cities. The three that are most important are the security surveillance, uh, autonomous driving and uh, manufacturing. Those are, those are where the most HPC AI applications are being developed. Some, people will say that China is not really generating new science. Uh, I, I don't completely agree with that. Next slide, because I think scale, scale actually does something. It actually helps to develop and improve applications in ways that uh, are hard to understand. Uh, two illustrations. Uh, imagine what you could do if you have a 500 million surveillance cameras all online at the same time, and you could actually process that data. Very interesting or new research in uh, re-identification, which is a technique for identifying images in different situations, or scale big enough to allow companies that have lots of real data that they'd like to process to uh, compute. So uh, I think there is good science going on there. Uh, last point is uh, China is wild about AI. This is, uh, there was a conference this uh, summer in Hangzhou, called the Global AI Technology Conference. The organizers claim that they had 13 million logins, 13 million. Even if that is off by a factor of 10, it's still, or even a factor of 100, it would still be a hell of a lot of logins. And I, I think it indicates something about China's interest in AI. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David, for, the, uh, uh, for that uh, glimpse into the Chinese um, supercomputing uh, systems. And now I'd like to turn over to the main event, I'll call it. Uh, Eric uh, has uh, prepared a talk about the top 500 list. If you can please cue that up and roll it. Good afternoon and good evening and welcome to the top 500 BOF session. It is my pleasure to report some of the highlights of the 58 top 500 list. In detail I'm going to talk about the various top 10s for the different benchmarks which we are tracking and for the Green 500. I'm going to talk about the differences in the commercial and uh, market for commercial systems and for research systems. And I'm going to talk about the signs we see in the top 500 in recent years for a further slowdown in performance growth which can be attributed to the beginning of the end of Moore's law. So with the top 10, uh, here is the top 10 of the uh, top 500 itself. Uh, you see in yellow all the changes um, compared to the June edition, there are only two changes. The Perlmutter system at position five installed at NERS Lawrence Berkeley National Labs 
has been measured uh, for its full configuration. It's about 10% higher uh, than the measurement we had in June, uh, which is now above, just above 70 petaflops on the HPL benchmark. It didn't allow it to change its position, uh, but it's a nice result never, nevertheless. On number 10 is the only new system in the top 10. And it's an interesting system because it's an instance of the Microsoft Azure Cloud. So with that, we finally have a cloud-based system in the top 10. It's not the only Microsoft Azure Cloud instance in the top 500. We have a total of five, and we have other cloud systems as well. And we expect uh, in the future that more of these systems uh, will show up, and some of them probably just as high or even higher uh, than the current number 10. If you look over the top 10 overall, you see a lot of the systems are actually based on the AMD EPIC chip. That has become a very popular chip about a, uh, for a pro uh, processor for uh, HPC systems. About 40% of new systems in the top 500 ha are based on the AMD EPIC chip this time around. You also see a lot of the systems are using the NVIDIA A100 as an accelerator to speed up the computations. And that's also uh, very typical for the systems in the top 500. So very little change in the, in the top 10 on this list, and we already talked about what might be missing at the top. But now if you look at HPC G benchmark, we actually see there were basically no changes. Uh, no new uh, HPC G measurement. Even Perlmutter did not get around to measure HPC C G for the full configuration. Uh, uh, the only thing new was really the HPL uh, measurement of Perlmutter. Now if you look in the second column of the table, uh, you see the positions uh, those systems hold in the top 500. And you see if you look towards the end, the number 9 and the number 10 system, those systems are ranked much lower in the top 500 itself at position 17 and 48. So those two systems are examples for systems uh, which are geared towards high memory access performance and high internet connect performance. Uh, and those architectural features allow them to achieve uh, high efficiencies on the HPC G benchmark which allows them to be in position 9 and 10 in this list, uh, while might being much lower on the, on the top 500 list itself. The number 9 system is Fujitsu's commercial offering based on the Fugaku architecture, so it has very similar features as the number 1 system, Fugaku. And the number 10 system is based on the N NEC SX Aurora vector processor, which is an architecture which is uh, known for exceptionally high bandwidth to floating point performance and that allows it to move up from position 48 on the top 500 to position 10 in the uh, HPC G uh, benchmark. So we also started tracking a, a different benchmark, the HPL AI benchmark. That is really a benchmark based on the original problem for the original HPL uh, benchmark, uh, solving a system of linear equation. But we do allow uh, mixed precision algorithms uh, to show, to track and to, uh, to demonstrate the benefits of mixed precision calculations for numerical calculations in algorithms which allow this. So the algorithm does an approximate solution in low precision and then an iterative refinement to full precision, uh, it, but is overall uh, faster, can be faster, uh, than uh, a direct solution. Uh, the um, performance we, at, uh, we attribute uh, to this run is based on the number of a, a number of floating point operations the original, op, uh, the original HPL benchmark would have to perform. And with that, uh, these systems here can actually exceed uh, their nameplate peak performance by running the HPL AI benchmark. So the number, first system, number one system is the Fugaku system uh, with just about two exaflops on this benchmark, equivalent exaflops, which is a very nice result. And the summit system, which improved the result to 1.4 exaflops, uh, is also well above its nameplate and is also very, very nice. Very nice to see uh, a, a, such a clear demonstration of the benefits of mixed precision algorithms if they are possible uh, to implement. Uh, with that, I like to show the top 10 of the Green 500. And the Green 500 is not based on a size of the system, but is uh, based on technology as it is ranked by an inefficiency uh, that is uh, gigaflops per watt. And with that, there is uh, typically a lot more turnover in the, in the Green 500 than in uh, the other top 10s. Uh, there is no difference this time. The number one system is the same as the last time. However, it had to uh, do uh, quite a few things, changes to the architecture and how uh, the algorithms are run and things like that to achieve a, a power efficiency which is one third higher than it was reported in June. So it moved from roughly 30 to now almost 40 uh, gigaflops per watt, and that allowed it to uh, remain the number one. 
uh, that's the MN3 uh, uh, system in, in, in Japan. So it's the old number one, but we've changed architecture, we've changed uh, uh, technology. Uh, the number two and three are new. The number two system is actually at position number 11 in the top 500, so it's a fairly sizable system. And it's based on a commercial offering, the HPE Apollo 6500 6, series. Uh, that series is very uh, power efficient, as you can see by a second entry of the same uh, type of system at position number eight, the Carolina system. Uh, so uh, we have commercial offerings uh, which are very power efficient, can be operated very power efficient, and th that's very nice to see. Uh, the number three system is also very interesting it's, uh, uh, because it's a prototype uh, from NVIDIA, installed at NVIDIA in-house, and it's a water-cooled uh, equivalent of the uh, DGX, uh, DGX A100 uh, module. Uh, so uh, the water cooling uh, improves uh, the power efficiency of that architecture by about 20-25%. And that allowed it to be uh, to achieve the number three position on the game 500. It's very nice to see that as well. Overall, there is a lot of commonality again in uh, the top 10 systems. A lot of them are using the AMD Epic chip, and a lot of, of them are using the N NVIDIA A100 chips for acceleration. Uh, there's a lot of commonality in terms of architectures. Okay, uh, with that, uh, what was the um, turnover uh, in the top 500? The turnover was actually fairly low, it's starting to recover a little, but the last two years turnover has been low, and that actually started before the pandemic. So while the pandemic certainly has an influence on that, it's not the only reason there are other, other things at work uh, which keep, kept the turnover so low uh, the last two years. Uh, in my opinion, it's mostly related to how China is reporting system, how aggressively they are reporting new installations uh, and uh, not reporting them. Uh, so that has an influence there, but it's much harder to tease that out. To see more clearly what really causes this uh, slow turnover, we actually looked at the different populations in the top 500, and we looked at, at, the, uh, at all the research systems in the list and all the commercial systems in the list and what their turnover rates are. And on, on, if you break it up like this, you clearly see that the lack of turnover is caused by the uh, lack of turnover in the commercial market and not in the research market. The research uh, market had a regular turnover the last uh, two years, while there is the commercial market had a very low uh, turnover. Uh, so it's, it's clearly uh, the reporting about the commercial system or the buying behavior in the commercial system, uh, which commercial market, which uh, causes this low turnover rate. Now, if you look at performance development in general, that's our signature slide, uh, you see the performance of the last system of the list, the first system of the list, and the sum of all 500 systems which is 500 times the average. So it's really um, uh, uh, reflects the average system size in the top 500 very well. And uh, we, we saw uh, a while back uh, two inflection points which are actually related to each other. Uh, we believe they're both caused by the end of the NAR scaling, uh, which at the end of the list uh, showed up in 2008. And then due to a delaying effect of uh, our, us as a community changing our purchasing uh, behavior accumulating more money by f uh, purchasing less frequently but then buying bigger systems. Uh, it took a full five years till uh, the effect was felt at all levels of performance in the top 500. Uh, but both of those inflection points we attribute to the end of frequency scaling than our scaling. Uh, the important thing to note here is that we saw it first at the end of the list and I'm going to use that and come back to that at the end of my presentation. So if you look into the list now in, in terms of the various uh, different aspects we usually look, you can look into where our systems installed. Uh, there was a big uh, inflow of Chinese systems about four or five years ago. Uh, that has stopped. Uh, we actually have a very a low number of Chinese systems being reported as an, uh, newly installed the last uh, two years. And with that, uh, the share of systems installed in China is decreasing, while the share of systems installed in other geographic locations such as the USA is uh, nicely increasing over the last couple of years again. If you break this up uh, uh, in the current situation in more detail, you see China still reports more systems installed uh, than the US, uh, but it's almost on par now, followed by uh, uh, Japan and uh, the main European countries. And if you break this pie chart now up in the two different markets, the market for research system, commercial system, we get a very different nuanced picture. Uh, those are uh, statistics based on the top 100 research and top 100 commercial systems uh, to get equal sized uh, populations. 
and you see the commercial market, there are a lot of systems are installed in China, while in the research market, the, and the number of Chinese systems installed at research institutions, which have been reported to us, is actually fairly low. Also, the United States, Japan, and European countries have a much bigger a share as consumers of supercomputing powers for research in installations. We can produce these statistics not only based on the uh, number of systems, uh, which is very influenced by small, uh, small systems, but also by the size of the systems, which is more equivalent to the value of the system and value of the market. Uh, so um, we can do that by just aggregating the accumulated performance uh, for these systems. And if we do that, we actually get a fairly different picture. We see that the slice of the United States, even in the commercial market, is much larger than it appears, uh, because the systems installed at commercial customers in the US is larger uh, than in China. So uh, the United States slice in terms of installed performance, even at commercial institutions, is much larger. Uh, on the left, on the left uh, pie chart, you see the big influence of the uh, very big systems like Fugaku, uh, which uh, bumped up the, the Japanese slice to the number one slice uh, in, in the statistics. And that's obviously going to change once the first uh, US and or Chinese uh, exascal systems are going to be uh, listed on the list. So that's, that, that is more sensitive to the very big systems. Uh, while the previous uh, slides were uh, sensitive to uh, the majority of the small systems. Now we can ask not only where these are installed, but where ha actually have they been produced. And if we do that uh, for those two market segments, we see again, if we go by number of systems, the majority of research systems has been produced in the US, uh, while the majority of commercial systems by number of systems has been uh, produced in China. And if you weigh them by the size of the system, we have the similar effect as we have seen uh, with the consumption consumers of systems, that, that the US is actually producing the majority of the performance uh, for commercial customers, 60%, while China is uh, producing about a third of the performance uh, for commercial customers. And on the left-hand side, again, you see the US now slightly ahead of Japan, uh, but the big bump uh, in the Japan, Ch Fujitsu and J Japan has produced again uh, by, uh, the from the Fugaku system in its uh, size. So we can further break down where systems are produced by taking each of these uh, geographic locales and uh, splitting it up in the various companies uh, based on those uh, geographic locales. And uh, if we do that, we see that the main, by number of systems, the main uh, company in the US uh, is clearly uh, the HPE, which includes the Cray label. Uh, in, Ch in, in China, it's Lenovo. Uh, and followed, uh, that is followed by, uh, Fuji by uh, Fujitsu in Japan and uh, Atos uh, in Europe. If we weigh these statistics now by uh, performance uh, instead of system size, we see the effect of the big systems. Uh, so in the US, uh, what f um, catches the eye is the green slice, which is IBM. IBM is catering the very big research institutions, so they have a couple of very big customers. Uh, which uh, gives them a fairly sizable share in terms of the performance market. Uh, in China, if anything, Lenovo's uh, dominance is even larger th uh, than before, uh, while Japan, the Fujitsu slice, of obviously gets a bit bump uh, from the Fugaku system. Now, having looked at uh, producers, we can also look at what actually happens in terms of chip technology and underlying technologies. And here you see the uh, most favorite uh, combinations of main processor and coprocessor for the research market and the commercial market. Uh, and you cl clearly see for both markets, if you add up all the different slices with Intel, Intel produces uh, between half and two thirds uh, of, uh, is used in half to two thirds of the systems in each of the markets, especially in the commercial markets where two thirds of the systems are simply based on Intel uh, main processes and no, no acceleration at all. Uh, the one slice which is notable uh, in orange towards uh, the end of the clock is the AMD uh, NVIDIA slice. Uh, those tend to be new systems. It's a very popular uh, combination the last couple of years. That's the AMD Epic chips with the A100s. And that bumps up the AMD slice uh, quite a bit uh, compared to the past. Uh, if we weigh this uh, slice again by performance instead of uh, looking at it uh, by system, we see the influence of the big systems. And now all the slices which have NVIDIA attached to it, uh, all the accelerator slices are going up quite substantially. And that's so one observation on both sides. And on the left-hand side, you also see the uh, blue slice on, on, at 9 o'clock 
uh, the arm slice is going up quite a bit. Uh, that's uh, due to the Fugaku system and the corresponding uh, Fujitsu um, offerings in the market. So overall, um, uh, you also see on the right-hand slide uh, the, um, the influence of the AMD and NVIDIA combination again, the Epic chips and the A100. Uh, that is nowadays the biggest individual slice uh, in, in the commercial market, uh, which might be a little bit surprising, uh, but it's very popular in the commercial market. So with that, I'd like to come back uh, to performance growth and what we have seen in performance growth. I already said we saw the inflection points due to narrow scaling at different times uh, for the bottom of the list uh, or for the whole list, for the average of the list. But we saw it at the bottom of the list first, uh, which prompted me to analyze the bottom of the list for the last couple of years in more detail to see really what's going on there. And for doing that, I looked at the bottom of the top 500 as well as the bottom of the research, top 100 research systems and top 100 commercial systems. Uh, and what you see here is uh, that there is an indication of something having changed in 2017. Uh, that's when I broke the curves. And the trend we had before, especially for the top 100 research systems, the orange curve, that trend doesn't seem to hold afterwards. Uh, the red line, I was not uh, following the orange line for the first two years, uh, which uh, clouded that whole trend quite a bit. Uh, but that was probably the aggressive uh, submissions from uh, Chinese uh, commercial uh, customers and, and uh, companies uh, which, um, which delayed showing that signal. But by now, uh, it, the red curve on average is actually pretty much parallel to the orange curve on the right hand side. And with that, the top 500 actually follows. So I would say uh, we, see, we see really clearly now after four years that performance at the end of the list has, uh, the performance growth has declined quite substantially. If I plot that uh, uh, trend line, you see the trend line is noticeably uh, lower than it used to be before. And we, I think we see it actually now, not only for research system, but we see it for the commercial market and we see it uh, in the top 500 overall. Uh, we do see it, however, at this point, only at the entry level of those lists. We do not see it yet as a clear signal uh, for the average system size. Uh, that could be a while till we see that. And that uh, could also be a while till we see that because uh, turnover rates in the list have, have been so small lately uh, that uh, the list doesn't change, overall doesn't change as fast as it used to. So I tried to find uh, the reason for this uh, new inflection point. And I looked at basically all the technological vari uh, related variables which we track in the top 500. And we have uh, all kinds of variables in there in our spreadsheets, which is number of cores, number of sockets, frequency of processes, number of coprocessors, cores, and so on and so forth. I looked at seven or eight of those. And the one which has the, the cleanest correlation and sig uh, signal related to this inflection point is simply the number of total cores in our systems. Uh, total cores that includes accelerators, so it's not just the main processes, it's main processes plus, uh, plus accelerators. And if, you, if I plot that for the whole uh, project since uh, 93 till now, that's, that's the average number of cores in our systems. And if you look carefully at that list, um, and that's a logarithmic scale of four orders of magnitude on the left, if you look carefully, you can roughly divide four different uh, epochs, which I did in this slide. Uh, the first, first four lists of the lists are unusually high. It was probably driven by uh, single bit processes like the CM2 and the MOSPAR2, uh, which uh, were counted wrong by today's standards. So they artificially increased the number of cores. After that, between 1995 and 2004, we had a period where the number of cores in the system was uh, just a reflection of the size of the system in terms of number of nodes, because we used single uh, core processes. And after 2004, we started using multi-core processes. So the number of cores in our system started going up more quickly than before. And that lasted up to about 2017. And since 2017, uh, the number of cores in our systems are not growing nearly as fast as they have been befo before. So a very clear signal was a little surprising. Uh, you could argue that it's re related to the large system not increasing in overall size and no counts, uh, but that by itself could not explain such a dramatic decrease in the number of cores. 
uh, what I think uh, really happens is that our ability to increase the number of cores on an individual chip, on an individual processor, has, uh, has decreased quite substantially. That, uh, that it takes longer for us uh, to go to the next node in chip technology and to, increase, uh, to decrease feature sizes and uh, that we have come closer to the end of Moore's law and uh, that the uh, tra traditional scaling and reduction of feature size is really coming to an end. So what I really th think we see here is uh, for the last four years is the first science that Moore's law as we knew it is really coming to an end. Uh, and we see it as a decreased uh, number of uh, cores in the, in the systems overall. Uh, which relates uh, directly to a decrease in performance increase uh, uh, of our systems. Now, if I take these uh, different phases, uh, which I lined up here, and uh, um, use uh, naive e uh, exponential extrapolations, I get the following gr uh, growth rate for the three main phases. And you see the growth rate we, uh, we, have, we are seeing it since 2017 is really substantially lo lower than anything we have seen in the past. Uh, so with that, uh, we can expect that uh, the increase in performance, our purchasing behavior and all those things is going to change quite substantially in the future. So to really see the effect of this more clearly, I took the last four years of the data since 2017 and went back to our regular slide and projected that out into the future to 2030. Now that's basically performance of the last system, first system, average system projected out till 2030. And you see with the growth rates, which we see in the lists in 2017, uh, growth uh, for a period of 11 years is now closer to a factor of 10 instead of a factor of 1,000, as it used to be. Uh, that's substantially lower. Uh, we can just barely expect by 2013, 2030 to have a 10 exascale, uh, 10 exaflop system. Uh, so performance imp improvement, performance growth. Um, we expect it to slow down quite tremendously, which in turn means architecture and algorithms and how we use these systems is going to change a lot. But it probably also means that we are going to change how we operate, how we procure the system, and what the emphasis of these systems is going to be in the future. So with that, I'd like to summarize. Fugaku remains the official number one on the list. We haven't received any other um, submissions uh, for any systems, may they exist or not. The turnover rate is still very low, it's slowly coming back up. Uh, the low turnover is really mostly a, a trip, uh, mostly related to um, Chinese manufacturers and customers reporting very few uh, ins new installations over the last two years. A lot of new systems are using AMD EPIC chips. Um, that's a trend been going on for a couple of years, a couple of editions now. And we see the signs since 2017, now we see more clearly the signs uh, that the performance growth in the list overall has started to uh, drastically uh, decline. Uh, we see a new inflection point, uh, which I attribute to the um, first stages of the end of Moore's law. Uh, performance growth going forward, we should expect to be much smaller than it has been in the past. And with that, uh, all kinds of changes are coming. I like to remind everybody again uh, that uh, uh, due to the changes of the ISC, um, um, date when they are going to hold their conference and the next submission for the top 500 is going to be earlier than usual it's going to be in May not in June uh, so keep that in mind for your next submission and uh, with that I'd like to turn it over to the Q&A thank you very much okay well thank you very much uh, Eric for that uh, summary of the top 500 stimulating discussion um, we're now open for questions and answers, uh, the question and answer session. So does someone have a question? Is there somebody monitoring the Sligo questions? So there is a question uh, here that says, could the reason for the 2017 inflection point in entry level systems be a reflection of the core improvements exceeding the bandwidth improvements? You want to talk about that, Eric? Well, the number of cores shouldn't be affected by improving our ability to increase bandwidth. It's an interesting conjecture, basically. What, what's hidden behind the question, what I interpret in that question is the assumption that by improving bandwidth, we overly increase performance, we increase the efficiency of our system. 
And uh, when does use that to l increase the number of cores less uh, than uh, they had in the past? Uh, but uh, overall, I would be a little hard pressed to, to, to I, I wouldn't have a criteria to really decide on anything like that. Um, that's, it would be nice if that would be the cause, because it would mean that there would be a compensating factor for increases in performance. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, at least the HPL Olympic benchmark uh, does not benefit. If there is an effect like that going on, the HPL does not benefit from it, because otherwise the end of the list wouldn't slow down. Okay. Let's see, any other questions from... Oops, we got our question person here. So I, it, you know, it's, um, when I take a look at what almost happened, almost happened meaning we could have had two exascale machines from China and one from the US being on this list. We just missed, I'd say, in having that. Uh, as David said, those two machines exist but haven't been um, uh, transmitted to us. And the Oak Ridge machine is almost up and running. If those three machines have been put on the list, that's going to have a dramatic impact on the curves that you showed, Eric, uh, in terms of really uh, shoving things up, up and to the right. Um, uh, so in some sense, that, that's going to have a big impact on how, how things go forward, uh, at least in the near term. Um, so yes and no. Yes in the sense, and I quickly did some math uh, when I saw David's slides, about what, uh, how big the impact actually could be. Of course, some of the slides, especially some of the pie charts, which are weighed by performance, they would change quite, quite substantially. Um, because uh, if you miss two exaflop on the list right now, and the total list only has three exaflop, you would miss 40% of the market uh, in that sense. Okay? Uh, however, whenever I talk about anything going on at the bottom of the list, uh, it's very different, but because the bottom of the list, if you have two new exascale systems at the top, uh, the top 100 would only move by two positions, which is virtually no change. So anything going on at the bottom, which, uh, which we see there, is virtually unrelated to how many exas exascale systems we, uh, we, oh, we see at the top. Okay. Uh, what, what might be affected is that interpretation that the number of cores, average number of cores per system has slowed down as much as it has. It wouldn't slow down quite as much, but it would still be there. The effect would still be there. So yes and no. Some, some of the graphs would look very different. Some of the, uh, some of the graphs would actually barely change. So, so there's a question about, so it says, will the supply chain uh, issues impact the trends in any significant way? So we're having, get, we're having trouble getting chips, and uh, will that impact uh, future high-performance machines uh, going forward? Anybody want to take a shot at that? On, on one hand, I would expect, expect so, but on the other hand, the question is really going to be, if a company uh, like HPE can choose which customer gets the chips they have. Is it gonna be that national center which pays $50 million for a computer? Or is it gonna be some medium-sized company which orders a system of 100,000? It's really up to the company to decide where they allocate the resources, where they sell it. Uh, so in that sense, it's not clear to me uh, that it would have an impact on the very high end. It certainly would have an impact on the computing market overall, but which segment is a uh, affected the most, that's, that's an open question. It comes down probably to margins, or which market has the biggest margins. We have a question here that uh, maybe David could help with. It says, uh, if China has an exascale machine that they didn't want to keep secret for obvious reasons, why wouldn't they submit it for the bragging rights? Yeah, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good question. As Jack, no doubt, knows there were submissions for Gordon Bell Award, which were based on uh, this uh, ocean light machine that I highlighted in one of my slides. Uh, and those submissions include information about the system. 
So it, it's not, it can't be a secret if it's in the, the paper, but uh, for one reason or another, one can speculate on the reasons the Chinese decided they were simply not going to submit to the top 500. Now, for the top 100, that's, as I said, a very bizarre list to me. And I suspect that there's more involved in those decisions than simply that the hardware was not ready. And let's see, there's another question here. It says, do you expect that some other accelerators apart from GPUs will gain traction in the top 500 soon? So what kind of accelerators do we have in mind here? We haven't seen any submission from the Google Cloud uh, or anything like that. Uh, that certainly would be an interesting candidate. Uh, it took uh, the other, uh, some of the other cloud providers quite a couple of years to actually show up at the high position like the number 10 position. And if you look at the specs of that particular instance of the cloud, it really resembles other HPC systems very closely. It uses a high-speed InfiniBand, it uses accelerators. So it's uh, another attempt with uh, a regular cloud with gigabit Ethernet to, to crack the top 500. Uh, I think at the very end, they, they're not trying to do that anymore. And it probably um, gets down to, is there a market for something? And um, is it going to be quantifiable? Yeah. The more interesting question is going to be, are there going to be accelerators which actually cannot run the Linpack benchmark, but run other things very well? That could happen, but um, we, have to, we have to see and wait for an example for that. Any other questions? Who has a question? I was going to have a comment, but oh, am I live? You're I live. wasn't sure okay. that it, the mic was on. Um, so, if you, uh, so in terms of other accelerators, uh, getting back to that uh, uh, question, um, mm -hmm. I, I think maybe fo folks have been, there have been uh, a number of people, uh, I think the Cygnus Project, uh, uh, SCUBA, uh, University of SCUBA in Japan was looking at uh, uh, integrating FPGAs into the, their supercomputers. Um, and, and the number one uh, supercomputer on the green, uh, 500 MN3 has its own set of um, uh, uh, deep learning accelerator cores, um, which which looks GPU-like. Uh, but uh, if, if for folks, I, I don't want to speak for for MN3, but if you want to hear some of the more additional details, the lower level details about uh, their accelerator, um, you can uh, attend the Green 500 BOF uh, tomorrow at this time. Any other questions from the people in the stands? I don't see any more that are coming in on the web. Slido. So maybe we can conclude early. OK, not hearing any questions. Um, I guess that'll be the end of this uh, Top 500 BOF session. Um, thank you for attending. The next uh, Top 500 BOF will be in Germany uh, in, um, I guess it's earlier this year. So it's in, is it at the end of May, beginning of June? Is that the dates for the, for the next uh, ISC meeting in Germany? And that's gonna be in Hamburg, I believe, uh, uh, next, uh, next year. So thank you very much for attending and look forward to seeing you soon.